and good morning. I apologize for that mishap there in the second course, but next week we'll get it squared away. <clears throat> I thought it was something strange when the sheet I had said, you know, thank you Jesus, verse 1, 2, and 3. And I look at the hymnal and there's only one verse, you know, I'm thinking maybe it meant two times through, so I put two times through. But here we realize just the chorus that was in the hymnal. So we'll get that squared away next time. If you would turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, Old Testament book, a prophetic book, great book of wisdom, great book of looking at what's going to happen in, in times. Ezekiel chapter 33 of my message this morning is what's wrong with America as you can see here on the, on the screen I had that in red you might not be able to see it there's a little dash right in front of Ezekiel which is white and Ezekiel is in blue where did I come up come, where did I get that from red white and blue did you catch that good some of you you know didn't really say anything I was a little offended because you didn't say I'm just teasing Ezekiel chapter 33 What's wrong with America? The host of a recent TV news program wondered, as I, when I heard, I've always taken the principle of the warning to the watchman in the book of Ezekiel very seriously. If you, if you have a study Bible on the top of Ezekiel chapter 33, you'll see Ezekiel is a watchman, he calls him. Verse starting, starting in verse 7, I'd like to read that this morning. It says, So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and then warn them from, for me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, who shall surely die? And you, and you do not speak to warn the wicked man from his way, that the wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful for this time we can come in your house this morning. Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to, to come and before your throne to worship you with freedom that we have in this country. This country that we call the United States of, of America, it's a great country. A country that we can be proud of. But Lord, you require something from us as a nation. You require something from us as a church that we have not been doing in this country. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see from your word what our responsibilities are. What are we to do as a nation? What are we to do as a church? What are we to do as individuals in this great country that we call America? Father, I pray that you would touch our hearts, prepare this, this message beforehand. As, we, as, as, I, as I prepare, I, prepare, I ask that you prepare our hearts to hear, to apply the truths of it to our lives. Father, speak through me in a mighty way this morning. Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> this message is probably, over the, since this pandemic started, this message may be the most important message I've preached thus far. This hit me this, this week as I've been studying and I've been going week to week by seeing, seeing what the Lord has prepared for me to preach. I came across this this lesson here, and I, I've thought about changing the title because it talks about being a watchman and what our responsibility is as a watchman over what the Lord has given us. But the title is pretty catchy. What's wrong with America? You may have thought that. You may have heard that. You may be even thinking that throughout this, as we turn on the news, as we, throughout this pandemic throughout this time of Black Lives Matter, throughout this time of human trafficking and come to light. Two weeks ago, I preached a message similar to this. So 
I was hesitant to preach this, but this is different. I need to make a statement before we begin. The statement is this, we have the Word of God. Raise up your Bibles if you can right now. We have the Word of God right here at our fingertips, right here in front of us. And we as individuals must be proclaiming it and warning America. In fact, since we sit in this seat on top of the world in this country, we must be proclaiming the Word of God and this warning to the world. So what's wrong with America? Let's divide this into two sections. First, the nation. Second, the church. Next slide. The nation. Does God still judge the nations? Now, it's true that blessings and curses in Deuteronomy were applied to the two kingdoms of Israel. But God judged the Amorites, the Canaanites, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness. In Amos and, in Amos and Jonah, the two Old Testament books, we read about God judging the nations. And regardless of what is intended by Babylon in Revelation, it's clear God judges nations when the outcry of their wickedness reaches him. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34 states this, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. As we read in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 35, that no nation that sacrifices its children is blessed by God. Did you catch that? No nation that sacrifices its children is blessed by God, but is committing an abomination before the Lord. It says, They built the high places to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech, though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. You see, the nations around the Israelites, the nations around the Jewish people, offer their sons and daughters as sacrifices to this God that was fake. This God called Molech. And we as a nation of, in, in, in this America has done the same exact thing. We have offered our sons and daughters to this fake God called pride. This fake God called it's not easy for me. Guess what? A child in your womb didn't have a choice. The person, the two people that slept together, they had a choice, amen? But the child, the innocent child, didn't have a choice. Abortion is nothing less than the sacrifice of children to the God of self, period. No doubt the stench of this horrendous sin, 60 million children sacrificed since 1973. 60 million children. Now let me just go to a side note here a little bit. Do you understand? Forget about the sin. Let's just move over here. Do you understand if you would add 60 million people to this country, to this world, how that would affect our taxes, how that would affect our cure for cancer and all the other diseases that we have. Maybe even this pandemic that we call COVID-19, there might be a cure when those 60 million people that were aborted had a, had a cure for this. We don't understand the devastation that's, that's happened because we have been sacrificing our children to self for, since 1973, it's been, only, it's been legal. Now let's go back to spiritual things. The only difference between the abortion and the fires of Moloch is the method. It's the same sin. It's just the method, method has changed. 
Our nation needs to be called to repent of this evil before it's too late. God doesn't let cultures who sacrifice their children get away with it. Eventually, if they do not repent, he deals with them swiftly. God warned the Israelites to put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and, and, in, G, and, and in Egypt, but serve the, and serve the living God in Joshua 24, 14. But America has, in a sense, thrown God out of the public schools and universities and indoctrinated generations to evolutionary naturalism, which is really atheism. Thus they worship this and serve the creature, creature rather than the creator. Romans chapter 1, 25. You see, Romans chapter 1 is a historical book, is a historical chapter going back in the nation of Israel, and it gives a snapshot. But if you read Romans chapter 1, it's really also prophetic for the United States of America because we've done the same exact thing that's mentioned in the Old Testament times. Why in the world would the United States of America, who's founded by biblical principles, founded by the Word of God, has done the same thing that Israelites have done? Why? Why would we do the same and repeat the same thing? Are we not smart enough? I'll get into that a little bit later. Romans chapter 1, talk about the wickedness. And it's a sign that God is judging the nation for wickedness, as we read in Romans chapter 1, which includes a sexual, homosexual, homosexual, gender revolution, and we're seeing in this nation. Turn over to Romans chapter 1, if you would. I'm going to read this section. I think it's important context as we look at this. This Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which, is, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, and our Lord, who was born in the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I make mention to, of you always in my prayers making a request that if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. That I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek. For in it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what I may be known, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which thou are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, 
nor were thankful for, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, and the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving them in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to, re like to retain God in their, in their knowledge, God would gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are worse whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, in inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous, God, judge, righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, that's a long chapter. And there's an introduction there that Paul has given through all of his letters, but he gets right into the point, doesn't he? He gets right into the point. He, goes, he starts right at the beginning of Genesis. And here's what's happening, he says. And he doesn't really specify Jews or Gentiles. He says, here's what's happened to humans. This passage, I believe, describes today's news headlines. Women loving women, lying with other women. Men loving men, lying with other men. That's homosexuality in a nutshell. Turn over to Matthew chapter 24, if you would. Matthew chapter 24. So Romans chapter 1 describes what's really happening from human history from the beginning of time. It can really just be described what's happening in our culture today. And we also observe a phenomenal exodus of young people from the church and the secularization of the younger generations now permeated with moral relativism. We could use the words of Matthew 24 to describe today's culture. Let's look at verse 10. And then many, many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Did you catch that? Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because of what happened in Rome, we see in Romans, because of the history that Paul was bringing to the, Ro to the Romans, to the Jews scattered abroad in Rome, telling them of what happened from Genesis on, basically, from Adam and Eve on. Because of sin, we grow cold, period. I want you to think back to the first time you saw a woman kiss another woman or a male kiss another male and how repulsive you were. And then fast forward to now, when you turn on your TV and you see a commercial from Kay Jewelers with two women 
giving each other a wing ring or two men giving each other a ring. We see a commercial. We see a Hallmark channel. Get this, ladies. A Hallmark channel. And you see them scanning the room of people dancing and two women are dancing or two men are dancing. But they just scan past it like it's no big deal. And now we see that and we're like, oh, that's ridiculous. But you don't repulse. Why? Because we've grown cold. Some, may I say, have grown colder than others. And I believe, but I believe in our culture as general, have, we have grown so cold that it's not even a big deal anymore. My wife was telling me this, this week, yesterday actually, I think two, or day, two days ago, that this 14-year-old girl has been missing. They've been missing, I'm not sure where, where exactly it was, but there's lots of young girls missing and they've been involved in human trafficking. And then one of the biggest proponents of human trafficking is the porn industry. And this woman, this person saw this little, this young girl being raped on this porn, hub, on this porn um, site. And now there's a petition going around to try to get this porn site down. Now, have you heard that in the news? Anyone heard that in the news? Why? Why are not Christians up in arms over this? Why aren't Christians banging down governor's doors? Well, we can't even find our governor, I guess. And or, or, or coming or going to the polls, going somewhere and blasting these people. So that brings me to my next category, the church. With all that's currently happening in, in our Western nations, and particularly in the U.S., the question arises, where is the church? Where is the church? From human perspective, knowing the gates of hell would not prevail against God's true church, the church in the West has suffered an incredible failure. The younger generations have been, by and large, left the church. Where are all the church leaders boldly standing against sexual perversion, LGBTQ, abortion, racism, godless evolution, teaching, and so on and so forth? Sadly, just as many in the culture are trying to erase history, the majority of our church has erased the history of Genesis chapter 1 through 11. Ken Ham wrote a book called Already Gone some years back. If you've never read that book, I, I encourage you to read that book. There's a couple copies out here in the, in the foyer. Already Gone. Talking about the younger generation, as soon as they hit high school, as soon as they graduate high school, they go into college, and they're taught evolutionism, they're taught atheism, and they're taught, you know what? Do you really believe what God says? Do you really believe what your church says? Do you really believe what your parents say? Do you understand that our, our young people are getting you know, bombarded by that question? And when they get bombarded by that question, they say, I, I, I don't know. I think. Why? Because they don't understand. They don't firmly believe what happened or what God says in Genesis chapter 1 through 11. That's what, Jen, that's what Ken Ham says. The Bible says to, make, to work out our own faith with fear and trembling. To work out our own faith. I always encourage my children to work out their own faith. Make God real in your own life, I say to them. You can't count on me. I cannot, my salvation cannot save my children. Amen? They have to be saved on their own account. And they have to work out their faith, whatever that looks like. And I cannot be offended or discouraged or, or frustrated or anything with that. I have to let them work that out on their own. However fast that is on their own. But I can stand back and I can sure pray. Amen? The Lord grabs a hold of them. Whatever it takes, grab a hold of them, Lord. Whatever it takes, grab a hold of her, Lord. 
Make yourself real to them. A chiropractor I go to here in town was telling me a story that his, young, his one young daughter, he had twin daughters, and the one young twin daughter left the church, denounced the church, because she just doesn't understand how God works. She doesn't see him working in her life and working the way that she was taught that he works. What a shame. See, without the history, there is no foundation of for our doctrine, for the rest of the Bible, for the gospel, for the Christian worldview. Without the history of God spoke it. God said, let there be light. Without the history that we see in Genesis chapter 1 through 11, there is no foundation to build upon. Whenever I talk to someone and I say, what's your church background? They say, oh, I've never been to church in my life. Wow, I got some work to do. I have to go back to Genesis. Do you ever hear of God? Yeah, I've heard of God. Do you ever hear of Jesus Christ? Well, sort of. Well, how do you think this world came about? Well, I don't know. A big bang happened. Go back to Genesis. See, Paul in Romans chapter 1 went back to what? Genesis. Here's the history of mankind right here. Here's what happened. If you read throughout the book of Romans, he goes back even further and specifies right to the children of Israel what happened in Adam and Eve, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. One cannot deal biblically without the issue like gay, with gay marriage or abortion or gender, racism, or any other issue without the foundational history in Genesis chapter 1 through 11. God said that, that, that let us make man in our own image, he says. Male and female. He didn't make Adam and Tom, right? He made Adam and Eve, period. Amen? Male and female. The majority of church leaders and Christian institutions have, have compromised Genesis with evolutionary naturalism. Today's pagan religion that attempts to explain life without God. So many church leaders condone or ignore homosexual behavior, transgender, abortion, and racism. In fact, get this, some of the mainline denominations are even putting homosexual pastors in the pulpit. I'd like you to turn to another, to another book, if you would. Old Testament book of Hosea. Hosea. Not too many lessons preached of, of a Hosea. I want to show you some things here. Hosea chapter 4. Starting in verse 1. Think about when he talks about Israel, Ephraim, and Judah. He mentions all three of them. Israel and Ephraim are the same. Judah is a, is a different culture. But think about them as it relates to the U.S. of A. Hear the word of God of the Lord, your children of Israel. The Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Huh. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with, that with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away. With the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with a the priest. Therefore you shall stumble in the day, Prophet will also shall stumble with you in the, in the night. And I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. The more they increase, 
The more they sin against me, I will char- change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their hearts, heart on their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. For they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall commit harlotry, but not increase. Because they have ceased obeying, ceased obeying the Lord. Harlotry, wine, and new wine enslave the heart. My people ask counsel for their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they they have played the harlot against their God. They offer sacrifices on the mountaintops, and burn incense on the hills, under oaks, poplars, and terebinths, because their shade is good. Therefore your daughters commit the harlotry, and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit a harlotry, nor nor your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with a ritual, ritual harlot. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. Though you, Israel, play the harlot, let not Judah offend. Do not come up, up to Gilgal, nor go up with Beth Haven, nor swear on an oath, saying, As the Lord lives. For Israel is stubborn, like a stubborn calf. Now the Lord will let them forage like a lamb in, 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 in open country. Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Their drink is rebellion. They commit a harlotry continually. Her rulers dearly love a dishonor. The wind has wrapped her up in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Hear this, O priest. Take heed, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of king, for yours is the judgment, because you have been a snare to Mizpah, and a net spread to Tabor. The revolters are deeply involved in slaughter though I rebuke them all. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you commit harlotry. Israel is defiled. They do not direct their deeds toward turning to their God, for the spirit of harlotry is in their midst. And they do not know the Lord. The pride of Israel testifies to its face. Therefore, Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah also stumbles with them. Now then, once again, that's a, that's a huge chapter. Lots to talk about there, but we're going to just pinpoint a couple key passages as it relates to this, what's happening in our culture today. When God's people, as recorded in the prophets of the Old Testament, compromised God's word with pagan religion of their age, what did God do? In, verse, in chapter 5, verse 6, he says he was withdrawn from them. With their flocks and herds, they, go, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him, for he has withdrawn himself from them. Now we know this is talking about the nation of Israel, but it's also really just talking about the nation as, a lar- as large. What happened? How is God going to react or respond to a nation that does these things? We see the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit being lifted in the culture as a whole. We see the church struggling to know what to do. He says in verse 6 of chapter 4, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being priests for me. Because you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. There's an exodus of children from the church. He says in verse 6 as well, my people are destroyed by what? Lack of knowledge. There's so much shallow fluff and stuff teaching in this modern church. Look at verse 4 and 5 if you would in chapter 4. Now let let no man contend or rebuke another. For your people are like those who contend with the priests. We can put in there pastor, preacher, teacher. Therefore you shall stumble in the day. The prophet, pastor, teacher, priest also shall stumble with you in the night. I pity those who stand up on a Sunday morning and don't preach the whole counsel of God. There's going to be harsh 
judgment upon them. I pity people like, dare I say, Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers, who preach a false teaching. I'm calling it a spade a spade. You tell me, you show to me from their messages, from their teaching, where, where God gets the glory. You will not. It sounds good, doesn't it? It's tickling the ears. It sounds really good. Joe, Joel Osteen's probably one of the best speakers that America's ever had. As far as his wording, the way he puts words together, his, his tone of voice, he's always smiling. You know, he's just, just a nice guy. But you, touch, you talk to him about Bible stuff, and guess what? He's a fool. He doesn't understand what Scripture says. Why is he not out with these millions of people following, warring against warning America? No, he's focused on you, better you now. Instead of focusing on what, what can we do as Christians to help this country turn back to God? He never mentions anything like that. It's always about you, 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 you. Most churches today are not teaching apologetics. If you come to Sunday school, I guarantee you we're going to teach, we're going to teach apologetics. What's that mean? How can, I, how can I fight the good fight and explain to you, to the average person, what this book means to me? And what the, what the Bible really truly says? That's a call apologetics. How can I know for sure that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? But well, First John says you can know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you have eternal life. We're not raising up generations to have a truly Christian worldview and to stand boldly and uncompromisingly on the authority of God's word, beginning in Genesis. We are not raising the next generation to stand boldly on this word of God. Amen. We are not. And we are failing at churches. Another Old Testament book, Amos. Sounds like Amish name, doesn't it? Amos, chapter 8, verse 11. I will send famine to the, on the land, not a famine of bread, nor, nor a thirst of water, but he, of hearing the words of the Lord. Did you catch that? God says, if you, if, you, if you go down this path, I'm going to send a famine on the land. I'm not going to send a famine of thirst and, and food. I'm going to send a famine of truth. And are we, not, are we not starving for truth here in the United States of America? Amen? We are starving for truth. Black Lives Matter is ridiculous. It goes opposite of truth. We can go right down the list. Boom, 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 boom. Everything we see here in the United States of America right now, we go right down that list and say that's untruth, 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 untruth. Because we are starving for truth. You know why? Because we stop reading the Word of God. We stop teaching the Word of God in school. We stop preaching the Word of God in pulpits. You look at Joel Osteen. You look at Joyce Myers. You look at all the top many pre preachers. I can name some more that's going to surprise you. How many times do they open their Bible? Think about that. Last time I was at my, my parents' church, they go to Christian Life Assembly. That's where they usually go. What used to go, I should say. Christian Life Assembly, right down in Harrisburg, Camp Hill. Big church up on the hill. Thousands of members. About 10,000 in a congregation. Last time I was there, it was on the 4th of July. I remember that like it was yesterday. 4th of July service. We came back from college. Bible college. Was visiting. We went there. After that service, I said, I would never step forward in this church again. Ever. They had a glass podium. Sitting right here in the pulpit. 
right here, right here in the, in the platform, glass podium. On top of that podium was a binder, a three ring binder laid open with notes on it. His Bible was tucked underneath the podium, closed. He was quoting and said in <clears throat> Romans, the apostle Peter writes this. I'm like, did you just hear what he just said? Now, you can't tell me he really thinks that Peter wrote Romans? I thought, well, maybe he just was mistaken. He said it again later. He pulls out the Bible, opens it up and reads something, closes the Bible back, puts it back underneath the stand. At the close of it all off, a guy gets up on the stage and plays the Star Spangled ba ba Banner, Jimi Hendrix style. I'm like, no way. One of the biggest challenges for facing Christ Christians face challenges facing Christians today is to find a church in their hometown that believes God's word and preaches it. That's a challenge, I'm telling you. There's a lot of good churches in this area. And I say good churches loosely. Friendly people, good people, some okay doctrine. But you listen to the preaching and you'll be saddened. It's hard to find a good Bible believing, strong teaching church. I know Keith and Millie travel a lot and they tell me all the time it's hard, isn't it? Amen? I visited other churches when my wife and I were in Dallas Bible College. We had a choice to any church we wanted to go to in the area. There's a list of them. They were closely related doctrinally to the college. We tried 10 churches before we found the right fit. The one that would preach the message. And you know what? We didn't like the music. We didn't, the, what, the music was okay in this church. We like the music over in this church over here, but we like the preaching over in this church over here. So guess what we went to? Where the preaching was strong. Now there are thousands of churches that stand on God's word, but they are, they are the minority. Amos chapter five, verse 23, to the melody of, our harp, of your harps, I will not listen. So much of the modern church has watered down the teaching of the word, I mean music, often with very shallow or wrong theology, the centerpiece of the church. With all our praise teams and music, is God listening to us? Or has God withdrawn because we are not honoring and teaching the word, his word as we should? Amos chapter 5 verse 22 says, I will not accept your offerings, he says. People give their time and money to the church, but is God blessing these offerings? Or is he calling people to return to his word and contend for the faith, in, as we see in Jude chapter 3? Jude 3. Let's look at verse 12 of, of Hosea. My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. The compromise of so many Christians, Christian leaders, to fit the beliefs of the world into God's word is no different than the whoredom of the Israelites when they compromise God's word with pagan beliefs of, the, of, of their age. Actually, I would say much, more, much of the modern church in the West is described clearly in God's word. Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 16, I know your works, you're neither cold or hot. Would that you were either cold or hot? He said, I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and either cold or hot, I spit you out of my mouth, he says. You see, God doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He doesn't want us to be split in the fence of in the church and in the world. He wants us to make a decision whether you're with me or you're against me. There's too many people 
pastors up here in this pulpit, up in, the, in these pulpits, and they're, they're straddling the, the world. One foot in the world, one foot in, in the church. Why? So they can bring people from the, from the world into the church? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you preach the word, people will come. And that's all we're doing right here. I can't change who comes to this church. I wish I could. All I can, all I know to do as a pastor is to preach the word boldly. And when tough times come, and those people that are in other churches not getting fed, not getting the, the care they need they, and the answers to the questions they have, they will find a church that gives them that. And my prayer is that this is a church like that. Folks, tough times are coming. Are we prepared for a harvest here? Because I believe if we're preaching the word, if we're, if we're diligent in preaching the word, teaching the word, following the Lord, word, being in prayer continuously with for other people, the Lord will bless this mightily. I believe that with all my heart. So much of the church today is lukewarm, shallow, compromising in various ways, looking more and more like the world and less like the word. Instead of impacting the culture, the culture has invaded much of the church. I reiterate the words of the prophet Jeremiah and cry out to the church, Learn not the way of the nations, Jeremiah 10, 2. As Christians, we are letting, we are to be impacting the culture from a spiritual perspective, not letting the culture impact us from a world perspective. Yes, the church needs to repent of compromise. God's people need to be watchmen and warn the nation and warn the church about what's happening. What more should we do? What's our role? A rule is found in Matthew chapter 28. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. You see, God's people, the church, are responsible for teaching the nations the difference between, between good and evil, between wickedness and righteousness. That's our role, as our, that's our role in our nation. This passage doesn't say to just preach the gospel, but to teach them to observe, observe all that I've commanded you. You see, there's a different principle there. There's a preaching and there's a teaching. And we're commanded not to preach, but what? To teach. And to me, that's one-on-one -on -one teaching. And not only is it one-on-one -on -one teaching, but it's teaching by example. Living our life as an example that teaches others this is the way it should be. Why is this command so, so important? Because God's, God commands our holy, righteous, good, and will make a nation, nation flourish. His commands are holy, righteous, good, and will make a nation flourish. If they are ignored, a nation will degrade. It's that simple. So we must teach the whole counsel of God. So three questions to leave you with this morning. What are you doing with this command? How are you measuring up to what the Lord requires of you? And lastly, how are you fulfilling your role as it relates to our nation and to our church? Let us pray. Father, as we close in prayer this morning, we are grateful for your word. As we have seen this morning, your word through your word and through even the Old Testament passages, how what you require of the nation that you've set in place. And Lord, you've set this nation of Israel up back in the day. You've set us as, as this nation called, called America up and blessed us tremendously because for centuries, for years, we followed your teaching, followed your calling in our lives. But Lord, we have turned away from that over time. And I pray that you will give boldness to the preachers in this country. You will give 
desire for them to be strong in, in your word, to not compromise, to, but to proclaim your word with boldness and clarity of heart. Bless us as we continue and close this time together. In Christ's name, amen.